Good morning. How's everybody doing? Morning, Charles. Morning, Bob. How are you? I'm awake. Okay. There you go. Well, that would get you like, you know, 99% there. There you go. <laughs> so. Hmm. Rebecca just called me and she said she was on Zoom. I wonder if she has the right link because she's not. She's not here, huh? No, she's not here. Let me put her back and see. Hello. Hey. Um, so I've opened up Zoom and Naomi and I and Bob and Richard are here, uh -huh. but you're not. <laughs> okay. I must have put in the wrong number. Could you give me the most recent number? Okay. Uh, dee, 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 dee. Let me see. Zoom. So what I did at the beginning of the quarter is I put the number for today's class in my Yeah, in your calendar? Phone. Oh, okay. and, yeah, in my cell phone calendar, and it mm -hmm. came up as this was the number. Okay. Um, it's supposed to be 978-26-1365. Okay. 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 I don't think that's what I put in there, and I don't know why, but I'll check that. Thank okay. you. Well, hang on. Shortly. Yeah. Let me, let me go back and... Take a look at something else. 978 Yep. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Anyway, how is everybody doing on this Monday? Everybody's a wide awake, huh? <laughs> yes. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe they are. Maybe they're not. We'll see. Let's see what this is. Uh, okay, yeah, this is with the... Uh, okay. These are my videos. That's good. All right. Ah, well... Library is three weeks later. That's what I want. Well, today we're going to get kind of wild and crazy. We're going to talk about the Baroque and why the Baroque was such a, a crazy time in art. But we're going to talk about some other things too. So, Including uh, Pablo Picasso. Yeah. Well, that's, a, that's a jump. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is. It may not be as much of a jump as you think, though. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he started off, actually, as a very representational artist and then uh, transitioned over into, you know, these whole new ideas about what art was all about. Oh, Rebecca, you made it. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. I'm glad I'm glad we got here. I am too, very much so. Nice to be back. Yes. Yes. How are you doing? Well, we are just grateful to be alive each day. We've been through a lot lately, but you know that's life and you just have to kind of roll with punches. Mm -hmm. Now you were up. That. You were up on in. I think you was it Maine. Um, all right, that's where my niece and nephew are. Uh, we were in, on Long Island, and my mother in law passed away. She was ninety five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, remarkable lady, remarkable life, and it was just quite um, a 
profound experience on everybody that attended and we were all glad to be together but it was very sad too to be together at such a sad occasion but that's life goes on yeah well, good to see you back rebecca yeah. thank you thank you very much yeah. i have been drawing thank you for drawing <laughs> yep um well you know i guess the only thing i can say is uh 95 is actually a pretty good run wow you're you're not kidding and um gary you can, you can do a few things with 95 right. years yeah <laughs> very intense personality okay now you did, you now what, <laughs> did she live in maine no uh my niece and nephew lived there and um she lived on long island oh and okay that's where all of uh, my in-law relatives live up in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. And so it's a treat to go up there, um, not on such an occasion, but it was still good to see everybody. And it, it's hard to even put into words those mm -hmm. kinds of emotions that you feel, but it was very sacred. It was very beautiful. It was very moving. And it was very... Um, uh, intense and special to our family and a, a wonderful experience after all. Well, yeah. Yeah, I've traveled up through Maine um, on a couple of different occasions and Vermont and areas like that. And it it's stunningly beautiful up there. It It's Winslow Homer territory is Maine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Well, also Andrew Wyeth. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Stuff. So, so yeah, there were, you know, many, many um, great American painters who, you know, lived and worked, you know, in those areas. So, uh, yeah, beautiful, you know, beautiful area of the country. So, sad you had to go up there for that reason, but uh, still, you know, lovely place. Anyway, we're going to jump into a couple of videos, um, you know, that are a bit historical. You know, we're going to start off uh, looking at the Baroque and the Baroque uh, is one of those periods of art that's probably one of the most misunderstood out of almost any art movement. And uh, so anyway, I wanted to play this. It's you know, it's full of a lot of good information. And, you know, if you don't know a lot about that period of time, it might actually help you kind of connect the dots uh, because it's really that time between the, the high Renaissance or the end of the Renaissance and then into a lot of the romanticist movements and things which carried on over into the salon and uh, different ateliers all throughout Europe. Okay, so uh, let's check this out. And uh, I hope you have a cup of coffee. It's going to be kind of a wild and fun ride. There we go. Okay. You... I think that's the one we want. And I'm on the county computer, so I will make this uh, full screen. But I love the height of these chairs. Like for being 6'2", it's perfect. Okay, how's the sound? Okay, so you can hear what's going on. How was it? Okay, good. Well, yeah, I know the other day, mm, not so good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I just wanted to make sure before we took off into this that you guys were able to hear everything. Who are the problems that you have with... This channel is part of the History Hits Network.
In the last film, we're over here in Italy watching the birth of the Baroque, and they ended up in Naples down here. Naples was a Spanish colony, and that means the next stage of our journey is over here in Spain. Oh my God. <laughs> chief reasons why the Baroque was as successful as it was, why it became the first global <coughs> art movement, was because it was so damn adaptable. The Baroque spread across Europe like a wildfire. And everywhere it went, it adopted the local tastes and customs and sneakily made itself at home. But when it got here, to Spain, it didn't have that much adapting to do. The Spanish were already fiercely Catholic. They liked drama, emotion, passion, darkness. They were, if you like, instinctively Baroque. So the Baroque's task here in Spain wasn't really a case of adaptation. It was more like pouring petrol on a large bonfire. <laughs> <laughs> The Spanish Baroque was hardcore. The most fiercely Catholic the Baroque became. Some of its sights will turn the dark and appall you. But the Baroque was the war, remember, a battle for your heart deliberately started by the Counter-Reformation. And in times of war, anything goes. This is the longest pilgrim trail in Spain, the southern route to Santiago de Campostello. It's called uh, the Via de la Plata, the Silver Road. And I'm going to be walking some of it for you because it takes you past so many key Baroque sites. <laughs> First stop I want to make is that lovely tower shimmering on the horizon. Seville, the start of the Via de la Plata. the old Jewish quarter in Seville. Can you feel the cultural potency bubbling up in this place? Ooh. This is where Rossini's famous opera, The Barber of Seville is set, and also Mozart's Marriage of Figaro. A bit further out, is the Baroque Tobacco Factory, in which that dangerous beauty, 
Carmen worked in Bizet's opera. What a grand building for a tobacco factory. What a perfect building for an opera. Now all this is pertinent because remember, opera is a Baroque invention. And fusing the arts together like this, music and theatre, dance <laughs> and spectacle, was a very Baroque thing to do. But that's not why I brought you here. I wanted to show you where Diego Velasquez was born, in that modest house over there, in Seville's Jewish Quarter, in 1599. Vasquez, Spain's greatest Baroque artist, would later pass himself off as a man of aristocratic bearing. What a haughty presence he affected in his own art. Official painter to the Spanish king, the dark dignitary, the maestro with the perfect moustache. But some energetic researchers have recently been digging up Velasquez's past, and it's been discovered that he was, in fact, of Jewish origin. His family on his father's side were Portuguese Jews who converted to Christianity, what they call around here conversos. Conversos, that's right. Vasquez, the son of a converso, could almost be called the first Jewish artist. paintings that Velasquez produced weren't portrayals of kings or Venuses or popes, but humble and very realistic depictions of ordinary life. They were called bodegons after the Spanish word bodegon, which means Velasquez painted a clutch of these bodegones. They're brilliant things, so atmospheric and tactile. You can hear the eggs sizzling. You can smell the garlic being crushed. Mm -hmm. Yep. The Brock's fascination with low life, bars, taverns, kitchens amounted to an obsession, and it shouldn't really surprise us. Remember, one of the chief aims of the Counter-Reformation was to address the hearts and the minds of ordinary people. So art was encouraged to talk their language and to set its action in their spaces. The Bodegones have a deeper meaning. Realism for realism's sake, was never Velasquez's only ambition. He was much too Baroque for that. <laughs> realism's job in his art is to hook you, pull you in closer, till you're close enough to see the painting's real meaning. Look into the background of the great kitchen scene in the house of Martha and Mary, and you'll see that Jesus got here before you. According to the Bible, Jesus came to visit the two sisters, oh. Martha and Mary. And while Martha visited the Mary sat at his <clears throat> feet and listened to his word. He's showing us the real part. When Martha complained that her sister wasn't helping out, Jesus stopped her. Mary, he replied, 
has chosen to listen. And in the end, listening to the word is more important than preparing the dinner. It's that yeah. rock message again. Life is short. Reality is an illusion. And only the word of God lasts forever. <laughs> Velasquez was so strikingly talented that when he was 23, he was summoned to Madrid by the king himself, Philip IV, and told to paint the royal portrait. So he left Seville and never really came back. But his new employers were about to discover a splendid Baroque rule. You can take a genius out of the bodega, yes, but you can't take the bodega out of a genius. The Spanish kings, the dreaded Habsburgs, were a spectacularly awful bunch. Dim-witted, arrogant, pious, deformed. But God, in his wisdom, saw something he liked about them and gave them most of the known world to rule. A gigantic international empire of three billion acres spread from <coughs> Italy to the Netherlands, from Africa to the Americas. But to rule, you need rulers, and that's where it had got tricky. Their problem was the usual royal problem of inbreeding. To keep the money and the titles in the family, the Habsburgs had spent too many generations marrying amongst themselves. Cousins, uncles, nephews, nieces. <clears throat> as great a portraitist as Velasquez had trouble telling apart the Habsburg princesses. This one is Philip IV's wife, as well as his niece. She was going to marry his son, but the son died young, so she married the dad instead. This one is Philip's daughter. This one... Oh, I give up. You need a degree in forensics to tell them apart. The most obvious physical deformity was their lower lip, the infamous Habsburg lip, which stuck out like an angle, like that. Seniors are getting an extra $2,000 from this senior stimulus program, but you can get it only if you claim it. This senior benefit book. A genetic condition called mandibular prognathism. They almost all had it. And that's why that old wives' tale does the rounds about why the Spanish lisp. It's because none of their royals could actually say gracias. They could only say gracias. <laughs> But even royal inbreeding, as scary as this, can occasionally throw up an interesting variation. And Philip IV, who was king here in Spain for the key Baroque years, 1621 to 1665, was a serious and thoughtful monarch. 44 years he ruled, and it's said that in all that time he only laughed at court on three occasions. Philip had the lip and that pushed in Habsburg face as concave as a Baroque church facade, but he liked the arts and was sensitive to them. Like all the Habsburgs, Philip IV didn't do much that was right. But in choosing Velasquez <laughs> as his court painter, he can at least be credited with one remarkable decision. Velasquez brought us closer to the Spanish kings than any audience had previously been to its royals. <laughs> this close up, we get to see, surprise, surprise, that they're just like the rest of us. Flawed, worried, wrinkly. When the time came to paint his most ambitious offering in the field of royal portraiture, Velasquez adopted the usual Baroque strategy of going big. 
that everything else we tried here was new and revolutionary, and it lifted the genre to its greatest heights. Las Meninas, The Maids. Velasquez's masterpiece. Set inside the royal palace, it's a group shot of the royal court. Many people will tell you it's the greatest Baroque painting of them all. It was painted in 1656, near the end of Velasquez's life. Now the reason why this picture confuses people so much, I think, is because there was such a huge cast list involved. When you first look at it, you think, oh, what's going on? Who are all these people? So, as a helpful guide to Las Meninas, I'm just going to introduce them all to you. The key figures, of course, are Velasquez himself on the left. He's painting away. In the middle, the Infanta Margarita. She's the five-year-old daughter of the Spanish king, Philip IV, and his wife, Princess Mariana of Austria. There in the picture too, reflected at the back, in the mirror, the back of the studio. Now everybody else who looks after the little princess is also in the foreground. These are her two dwarfs on the right. Female dwarf in Germany, Maria Baloba, famous dwarf at the court, Italian dwarf on the right, putting a foot on the princess's great big dog, the royal mastiff, playfully giving it a kick in the back. And behind the princess, you see the two shadowy figures. The woman on the left, she's the princess's chaperone. And the figure on the right, that's the princess's bodyguard. So right at the front of the picture, You've got all the people who look after the princess, princess herself, and Velasquez painting busily away. Velasquez shows himself looking like a member of the royal household himself. Look how haughtily he stands with that excellent moustache. And he's at work on this huge canvas on the left. Why is he actually painting? I think that only makes sense when you work out what's actually going on in this picture. The king and the queen are actually standing out here, where the audience is now looking at the picture of Fresh. So Velasquez is painting the king and the queen who are standing over here. And the king and the queen can see themselves in the mirror, perhaps to check how they look, but also because of this beautiful game of psychological trickery that's going on here, they seem to be looking out at us at the same time. But what's this picture really about? Who is the focus of all this action and all this psychological toing and froing? It has to be the Infanta herself. This sweet little princess right at the middle of the picture. And because the Habsburgs had this terrible history of inbreeding, they had nothing but bad luck in the production of children. And although Philip and Mariana had five babies, at the time this picture was painted, only one of them was alive, the Atlanta Margarita. The princess with her blonde hair and her gorgeous white silk dress is like an angel of deliverance at the center of this black and doomy and intense and psychologically troubling group portrait. She represents all their hopes for the future. There were only two possible sources of a commission in Baroque Spain. You either worked for the kings or you worked for the monks. Keep working, man. The Habsburgs had Baroquely discovered the power of art. But the real rulers of Spain had always known it. No, really. I'm afraid yeah. I've got
Baroque's bad news theory. If you want to understand the Spanish Baroque reasonably well, better than all those around you, then you need to brush up on your religious orders. I know it's not very 21st century, but if you can't tell the difference between the Franciscans and the Dominicans, or the Mercedarians and the Carthusians, then so much of what's going on in so many amazing Spanish Baroque paintings will go over your head. Why, for instance, is he upside down? Why is he writing on himself in blood? Why are they nodding off? And why is he staring so darkly at that? To help you out, I've prepared a handy pilgrim's guide to the Spanish religious orders. You'll thank me for this. This one here, he's a Franciscan. Brown robes, knotted cord for a belt. Franciscan. Sometimes the clothes get more ragged and patched, but they're still Franciscans. He, on the other hand, is a Dominican. Black cow, white robe, Dominican. Quite often seen in the Americas, converting the Indians, or sometimes whipping off their robes and flagellating themselves. Dominicans. The ones in the black robes are Benedictines. Remember, black robes, Benedictines. They don't appear in art as often as the others. They're the moody, silent ones. So did you get all that? Franciscans, brown. Dominicans, black and white. Benedictines, all black. Now, you're ready for the Spanish Baroque. Now you're ready for Francisco de Zurbarán. Spain's spookiest Baroque artist. He was born here in Fuente de Cantos, the fifth stop on the Via de la Plata. So his understandings were small town understandings. And his rhythms were the rhythms of the pilgrimage. These days, Zorbaran is reasonably well known. But at the start of the 20th century, he was completely obscure. In fact, most Spanish art, apart from Vela... You've always dreamed of retiring together, but does your roadmap for the future protect each other if anything happens? You have goals. Velasquez was underexplored and undervalued. I think it was so dark, so strange, so Catholic, that we just didn't get it. And in particular, we didn't oh, get Zorbaran. <laughs> These are, let's face it, bizarre and unsettling images. Uncomfortable funerals. Impossible deaths. The Zorbaran family house on the main square in Fuente de Cantos. Quite a posh house now. Must have been really posh in the 17th century. Zorbrand's father was a prosperous textile merchant from the north, Basque country, who moved down here because southern Spain, particularly Andalusia, was experiencing this boom in new religious building. And there's so much money here for the priests and their new outfits. So there's a lot of work for the Zorbarans. Many years later, Francisco de Zorbaran painted a mysterious series of Christian martyrs, beautiful female martyrs, all of whom were dressed in modern clothes. They're some of the most beautifully painted and exciting clothes in 17th century Baroque art. People said that Zorbran was using his father's 
textiles in these paintings, advertising them, using these Christian martyrs just to show off what his dad had for sale. Zurbaran's main employers were the Spanish religious orders, the Mercedarians, the Carthusians, the Benedictines, the Dominicans, and the Franciscans. One day, Pope Nicholas V visited Assisi. He wanted to see the crypt where St. Francis was buried. And at five in the morning, he went down into the crypt with a band of monks. And all they had with them was torches. And as the torchlight spread around the dark crypt, suddenly they saw St. Francis standing there, 200 years after his death, still as fresh as if he'd just stepped out of a bath, untouched unblemished, as if time hadn't touched him. So Brown went on to do many other things, but monks were his speciality. Monks were where his genius was best expressed. And it's not just the vividness with which he illustrated their uncanny stories, but that sense you get with him that Zorbaran's monks are so convincingly full of God, full of worship, full of thought. No painter has painted human belief as convincingly as this. <clears throat> the Baroque pilgrim, trudging dutifully the 600 miles from Seville to Santiago de Compostela, would have had regular encounters with the Spanish Baroque. And waiting for them at the end of the trudge was an eye-catching eruption of Baroque architecture. Chaucer's wife of Bath came on the pilgrimage to Santiago. It's been the most famous pilgrimage route in Europe for a thousand years. But it was the Baroque era that shaped the town itself and gave Santiago de Compostela its memorable and exciting look. Yep. The cathedral here, to which thousands of busy pilgrims scuttle daily, is a Baroque wedding cake in the Churiguinesque style, which, yep. as far as I can tell, consists chiefly of adding things to places when there isn't really room for them. But somewhere within this crazily writhing, sculpture-encrusted fantasy facade, methinks me sees the remnants of Spain's Islamic past. We don't have that in the United States. <clears throat> no. Architecture, we don't have it. <laughs> Don't go to San Antonio. Inside the great pilgrimage church at Santiago, the Baroque's love of glitter has been spectacularly unleashed. Guilt may have driven the Spanish Baroque, but gold was what paid for it. Yep. 
the stupendous wealth of the American colonies was flooding into Spain, and then into the pockets of the Catholic Church, which spent it, as the Catholic Church so often did, on art. You know, there's never been an art movement as adept as the Baroque was at absorbing local influences, taking them all in, regurgitating them, and then spitting them out at the other end as something that looks unmistakably Baroque. <clears throat> you can't imagine this building in Italy or France or, perish the thought, England. It's obviously from around here, but with all that thrusting and swirling and movement, it's just as obviously Baroque. Into the storage room, I'll be back. There is one <laughs> slab of the world stuff. where you can uh, easily Christmas. imagine this. When I say the Baroque was the first truly international art movement, I mean truly mm. international. The Churigaresque style may not have travelled to Italy or France, but it travelled all right mm -hmm. to the far, far corners of the Spanish Empire, where it ended up in some very remote places. Wherever the monks went, the Baroque went. And it ended up as the house style of the whole of Latin America. But not all of the Baroque's travels were quite so exotic. How the Spanish kings came to own Belgium is a dark political story involving so many battles and so much constant religious conflict that we'd be here for as long as the Hundred Years' War trying to understand it fully. Let's just say <laughs> they were here and they shouldn't have been. In any case, what interests us is the art that came out of the Spanish Netherlands. And for that, you need a strong stomach. Spanish were here for nearly 200 years, but you'd hardly know it. There's so little sign of them left. A few plaques, some statues, and this mag- Does your skin pass the pinch test? Let's try an experiment. If the skin on your face looks loose and wrinkled, or just seems to hang low- Magnificent Baroque Square in the center of Brussels, the Grota Market. It's as action-packed a square as the Baroque ever produced, with its ring of spiky and busy Baroque buildings. The Grota Market is a 50-course banquet of architecture in which all the courses are served up at once. You. Superb building at the end, the House of the Fox. That used to be the headquarters of the Haberdashers Guild. Next to it, the Guild of the Boatmen. Their centre was in the House of the Horn. See the big gold horn there. But the most interesting for us is the one at the end. See there? That used to be the headquarters, the Baker's Guild. It's now a pub called the King of Spain. Right on top, a statue of Charles the Second. Mm -hmm. Even by the standards of the Habsburgs, Charles was a terrible advertisement for royalty. 
All those generations of Habsburg inbreeding had turned him into an imbecile. Hmm. The only surviving son of Philip IV, he couldn't walk or talk till he was seven. Hmm. And an aging nurse breastfed him till he reached puberty. Hmm. Too weak to survive an education, he grew up illiterate and squalid. So they made him king of the Netherlands <laughs> and named this pub after him. Yeah. It was a monumental clash of cultures. The Spanish <clears throat> with their black, intense, morbid gloominess and the fun-loving Flemish with their naughty, juicy, fleshy lust for life we're never going to see mm. eye to eye, but somehow the coming together of these two momentous opposites squeezed so much monumental art into the world. Mm. I probably don't need to tell you who the best known representative was of the Flemish tendency. His notoriety goes before him. He's one of those artists who seems to have nothing much to say to the modern world. So our times have taken a dislike to him, but not me. I've got all the time in the world for Peter Paul Rubens. Rubens shouldn't be out of fashion. An artist as great as him, should never be out of fashion. This was one of the towering geniuses of art. A serial achiever on so many Baroque fronts. For instance, he designed that. And this tower here. And he painted that. But he's notorious, of course, for his love of fat women. The adjective Rubenesque has entered our language to describe the Dawn French type. The big one, the size 16er. And there's no point denying Rubens liked the fuller figure. Mm -hmm. The like art bulges at the seams with a huge tonnage of happily wobbling cellulite. The bigger woman rang his bell and squeezed his pips. But he wasn't alone in that. That's how the Flemish like their women. Oh. Rubens's career coincided neatly with that rare thing in Flanders some decent Spanish leadership. In fact, there were two governors overseeing the Spanish Netherlands in tandem, the conjoined married pair of arch. Create a deck that will last a lifetime with the gorgeous look of Trex enhanced deck boards, a durable way to add a beaut. Dukes. Albert, over here. And Isabella. And Isabella. Albert and Isabella ruled here from 1598 to 1621. She was Philip II's daughter. He was the same king's nephew. So they were actually Habsburg cousins and should never have married. But when Philip II made them the joint governors of the Spanish Netherlands, Albert and Isabella surprised everyone by being rather good at ruling the Belgians. And their arrival put a stop, temporarily at least, to the constant round of Flemish warfare. And it was in this period of peace and prosperity that Rubens began to operate. Rubens, interestingly, had been born a Protestant. His father was a Flemish convert to Calvinism. But when the father died, 
the family converted back to Catholicism. And you'd never guess from Rubens's Catholic handiwork that he'd ever been away from the faith. This stupendous masterclass in Baroque movement and emotion, the descent from the cross in Antwerp Cathedral, is Rubens's greatest moment as a creator of thunderous religious theatre. If this doesn't move you, you've got no soul. Young Rubens unleashed sex and violence on us too in this scary Baroque manner. It's hard to believe what's going on here. And my God, will you look at that? But let's not be hypocritical about these dark and tremendous action pictures. Judging by the stuff that pours out of our cinemas today, a taste for this has always been in us. Rubens was merely early in admitting it. If you know Rubens only for his naked orgies and his show-off mythologies, you might be surprised to discover that he had a quiet side, a lovely, gentle aspect. Rubens couldn't stop painting. He was a tap that couldn't be turned off. It was habitual for him, a necessity. So when the King of Spain wasn't commissioning him, Rubens painted something much closer to hand instead, his family, just for himself, just for the pleasure of it. His first wife, the charismatic and eager-eyed Isabella Brandt had died tragically young in 1626. Rubens was devastated. He'd put so much love into painting the two of them, sitting there in their Sunday best, two cooing lovebirds in a bower. But it was his second wife, Hélène Formont, who played the largest part in his art. He married her when he was 53. She was only 16. She's that yeah. fleshy, blonde, nude who appears in so many of his mythologies. The best model ever for the Rubens girl. You can definitely tell from his art how much he wanted her. The many portrayals of Hélène Formont sizzle with lust. The joyous lust of a 53-year-old man who's hit lucky with a beautiful 16-year-old girl. It doesn't sound good, I grant you, but he loved her and he wanted her and it shows. Never before in art have we been granted this much access to the private life of a celebrity artist. 400 years before Hello! magazine, Rubens had already realised that the world was now fascinated by everything he did. That's how ahead of the times he was. That's how Baroque he was. Rubens spoke six languages fluently, and he moved easily among kings and popes. He was the consummate schmoozer. So, in 1629, the Spanish king sent him to England to schmooze Charles I. 
which Rubens successfully did. So Charles knighted him, and the University of Cambridge made Sir Peter Paul Rubens a master of arts. Soon enough, the Baroque would follow Rubens to England. But first, there were still lands to conquer closer to home, just a border away to the north. Welcome to Holland, the wettest stage in the Baroque's great journey from Rome to London, from St. Peter's to St. Paul's. So far in this series, we've been investigating the Catholics. They invented the Baroque. It was their movement, their mindset. It reflected their passions, their hopes, their fears. But, as any mother will tell you, babies don't always grow up as you expect them to. And that was definitely true of the Baroque. By the time it got here, to Holland, it was much too big and boisterous an art movement to be controlled by one religion or one mindset. Indeed, one of the most remarkable things about the Baroque is how brilliantly, how confidently and inventively it switched its allegiance from the Catholics to the Protestants. The greatest Dutch painter of them all, Rembrandt, was a classic Baroque hero. Intense, dramatic and ambiguous. Rembrandt was born a Protestant here in Leiden, a fierce Calvinist stronghold on the edge of Holland. But to make it, he had to leave Leiden and move here to Amsterdam, where he turned very Baroque and quickly made his mark. All that's actually happening in Rembrandt's tumultuous night watch is that a company of home guards, a Dutch dad's army, is setting out on its daily march around the town. But the sense of occasion here, the emotion, the movement, the drama is so big and so baroque, you'd think they were off to save the world. Leiden may have been a Calvinist stronghold, but Rembrandt's mother actually came from an old Catholic family. And to my eyes, he inherited a popish intensity from her, a Catholic fretfulness and sweatiness when I need parts I can trust, I go to eBay Motors. They have all that gives all of his art its biblical air. Rembrandt couldn't keep out of his own art. This intense little man from Leiden took such a shine to his own face. He kept painting it and repainting it more often than any artist had ever done before him. In 1635, he showed himself flush with Amsterdam's success, celebrating his early good times with his beloved wife, Saskia. But even here, there's doubt in the air. Rembrandt's self-portraits lead you on a merry goose chase as they peep in and out of his soul. I'm particularly fond of this mysterious bit of method acting painted near the end of his life. 
the self-portrait with circles. Why is he standing there with two big circles painted on the wall behind him? There have been lots of interpretations, but the one that convinces me involves an old story that was told about Phidias, the greatest painter of classical times. Phidias was famous for being able to draw a perfect circle freehand without a compass. And Rembrandt in his aging self-portrait with circles is surely saying, I can do that too. But he's not saying it with great conviction, is he? Because there's always so much doubt in Rembrandt. So much hesitation. A sadness that draws you towards his irresistible vulnerability, like a magnet. And this realization that the problems of an artist, his insecurities and inner life were worthy of a picture, was one of the Baroque's most brilliant insights. It was the first art movement to realize that people are as interested in weakness as they are in strength, that doubts are as compelling as achievements, and that the real hero is sometimes the underdog. Protestant Holland put the ordinary doubts of ordinary people at the centre of art. You didn't have to be a pope or a king or a mythological hero to deserve your place in art. Everybody deserved their place in art. You see that chap up there? Second from the left at the top, right at the back of this busy crowd scene. Do you know who that is? He's a personal hero of mine, one of the great geniuses of the Dutch Baroque, an artist blessed with some of the fastest hands in art. That is Franz Hals. Franz Hals is perhaps best known for painting this smirking chappy, known to us all as the Laughing Cavalier. In fact, he isn't laughing and he isn't a cavalier. He's an unknown Dutch bravo, exuding such excellent nonchalance. These chaps here were all members of another of these Dad's Army Brigades a squad of amateur soldiers from Harlem called the Civic Guard of St. George. In theory, they were there to protect the city in times of war. In practice, they met a few times a month and socialized energetically. This is their end of term photograph in which everyone in the class poses for a picture. These things are really tricky to paint. With a king or a pope, you just put them in the center of the picture and that's that. But the Protestant democratization of art caused all sorts of compositional problems. Here you have 15 people, all of whom have paid to appear in this picture and all of whom expect to be seen properly. House was a genius at getting that right. Look how skillfully he arranges them around the table, turning this way and that. A couple at the front, some at the back. It's a magnificent piece of human orchestration and it creates that restless sense of movement of the action swirling about the picture that is so quintessentially Baroque. And there's something else, something even more Baroque than all this restlessness. 
These men are meant to be soldiers, but you never see them fighting. They're meant to be civic heroes, but there's no aggression in their eyes. The St. George Civic Guard, of which House himself was a member, is instead always shown banqueting and chatting and bonding. That's because these showy banqueting scenes are actually subtle pieces of Baroque propaganda for peace. Holland had seen so many wars and squabbles and wished so desperately for them to end. But instead of coming out with that in some aggressive propagandist way, House implies it subtly, sneakily, baroquely. God's great bounty should not be squandered on war and conflict. This subliminal moralizing became the chief obsession of the Dutch Baroque. You can't trust any of this art to mean what it seems to mean. Especially not when it's been painted by that elusive Dutch genius who smuggled the most subtle subliminal messages into his pictures. Jan Vermeer of Delft. I'm like everyone else. I love Vermeer. Those frugal and tearful women of his, lost in their own thoughts, trying to read a love letter as the weak light of Delft <coughs> struggles through their window. They claw at my masculine attention. I can't resist them. But Vermeer is as much of a moralist as the rest of them. His beautiful and thoughtful women dreaming of their loved ones, strumming their guitars, tinkling at their virginals, <laughs> demand that you note their fragility and breakability as they offer themselves up so simply for your inspection. These are moods so delicate that the lightest knock would shatter them like crystal. <laughs> A climatic nuance a shadow, a touch, a gesture. The final meaning of life is conveyed in such subtle ways. In the end, what's being understood here is the fragility of life itself, the vulnerability of beauty, shortness of youth. And the fact that some, or even most, of Vermeer's girls with pearl earrings were probably the painter's own daughters adds so much poignancy to his message and personalises it so baroquely. These are not theoretical understandings that are being passed on to us here. These are understandings born of fatherhood and observation. <laughs> himself was a thoroughly obscure figure, completely forgotten for 300 years before the 19th century we discovered him. But this lack of reliable fame seems somehow to supplement the meaning of his pictures. Here today, gone tomorrow. That's the artist's life for you. age of Dutch art spewed out so many fascinating painters and I'd be happy to spend many months here remembering them for you but staying put is not Baroque behavior this series promised to take you from St. Peter's over here to St. Paul's over there and that means we've got some water to cross 
take an afternoon break to see your next home. Or maybe the evening is better. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Jamal Jones. I'm seeing sick. Hang on. All right. So what do you think of that? Well, a lot of information. Good. What's good? Yeah. But you see how he rounded all those artists up? You know, Velasquez, Goya, you know, all the Spanish artists. Also, you know, a lot of the Dutch painters and rolled them all into, you know, Baroque. the movement, the Baroque. So, <laughs> and, you know, that was that period, you know, really, again, you know, it's it's after the late Renaissance. And then it moved into the Baroque. And then into what we would call, you know, academic painting, you know, in France and things. So that really got you up through uh, about the end of the 15th century, okay, is when when all of that, you know, sort of ended. Um, of course, the one thing I wanted to say to Armando is, yeah, I mean, you came from South America, you know, mm -hmm. and Colombia in particular, but... You know, there are Baroque churches, you know, all yeah. over. Uh, yeah, we got some over there. Inside, outside, it doesn't look like it does in Spain, but inside, we have those out there. Yeah. So, no, you know, Pero in Spain had a lot. Yeah. Big. Well, yeah, but again, you know, they were kind of, they were kind of like far-flung satellites of Catholicism at mm -hmm. that point. And, and what was going on is rather than the Spanish court sending wealth to those colonies, they were extracting it from them. So, oh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so they didn't I have, have them up. yeah, they didn't have the opportunity to come up with like a lot of the, the high end, you know, architecture and decoration and stuff in most cases uh, that you did in Spain. So, mm -hmm. You know, some, you know, <clears throat> some even people criticize us the Catholic, the Catholic Church. Something I observe to the history that Catholic Church uh, support a lot art in the oh, Renaissance yeah. in the Baroque area uh, time. Well, they did through the Renaissance as well. Yes, yeah. I thought it was very interesting. A lot of information. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> But yeah. yeah, when you when you hear, you know that word baroque, um, you know maybe you'll think of it a little bit differently, you know because it it really, you know what we're looking at is we're looking at about a a three probably about three hundred and fifty year long period, you know oh, okay. of history, from the time of the that long? uh huh yeah mm -hmm. yeah so what what would be the the one element that would distinguish this whole movement as Baroque in the painting. I can see it in the architecture, but what would be the one main classification? In in the paintings, uh, right. pretty much so what was universal in, in Baroque was that sense of drama and action. And that's why um, even though Caravaggio is considered a late Renaissance painter, uh, I think he was really the beginning of the world. Okay. You know, when you looked at his paintings, you knew exactly who who did them, you know, because of the chiaroscuro and the, the light dark. But it was also the movement. You know, there was always, you know, none of his paintings were static. It just wasn't some somebody just, you know, passively sitting there. And even in Vermeer, um, even though, you know, for the most part, you know, most of his paintings were a single fig figure in front of the window or or, or whatever. Um, it still implied movement, you know, movement or some kind of mood. You know, there was some drama going on there, you know, and um, and that that carried through the whole Baroque period. So. Charles, to me, it was interesting to see how the Baroque movement played out in the different cultures. And I didn't remember how much uh, influence the Spanish uh, kingdom had over all of Europe. Mm -hmm. 
for such a long while. And right. there, there was one, one little throwaway line in there that I loved that the, um, the guy that was leading it said, everybody deserves a place in art. I thought that was really cool. Yes, I thought well, that, that was, was terrific. Yeah. Well, that was that was after that was after, you know, the Baroque movement moved north right. into, you know, the Netherlands and Holland. Right. Um, and remember, you know, that, you know, there, there was a, a huge uh, Protestant movement in right. and the Protestant movement actually started in northern Europe, you know, in Germany, the Netherlands, Holland, you know, in those northern areas you know catholicism was still extremely strong you know in all of you know southern europe you know italy spain france right. they were all very strongly catholic and right. even even england up until that time uh was strongly catholic you know until the the reformation when uh, what was it king henry henry the eighth no, it wasn't eighth. It was, I think it was before him. Um, he made it official. Uh, well, I think it was, no, I think it was before him. It was one of the earlier Henrys that, you know, created the Church of England, you know, which was Protestant. Uh, and I want to say it was like the fifth or something like that. Yeah, he came. Oh, Henry the eighth. Was it Henry the eighth? Henry yep. the eighth <laughs> wanted a divorce. Yeah. So that's why they turned to Episcopalian to get rid of the Pope because mm -hmm. the Pope wouldn't give him the divorce. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, re I remember that. 1500s. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, yeah, that's how, how England, you know, got off onto, you know, being a Protestant stronghold, you know. Also, they wanted the money. The church owned all that land. Oh yeah. It wasn't only his divorce. They wanted all that land. Too. Well, it was land, it was power, it was so many things. power, land. Uh-huh. Yeah. And 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 a big <clears throat> motivation in that was also, you know, him separating from the Catholic Church, took off the gloves, you know, and you know, freed him up so that he did not have to play so nicely with France, who was still very much so Catholic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Henry definitely had designs on conquering the French and, and sort of, you know, taking over a bigger part of Europe. So during that period of time. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of historical factors that, you know, tie into all of this. But uh, it was an interesting it was an interesting period of history. And I like Rubens. He liked heavy women. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and those dying heavy women was the <laughs> yeah well Rubens yeah Rubens was only one one of many artists at that time who liked you know the more you know fleshy round you know figures uh, mm -hmm. but it, that was definitely something that was more popular in the northern part of Europe than in the southern right. you know uh, eventually you know, about a what maybe a hundred years later, you know that sort of seeped into even French painting. You know, if you look at uh, Bouguereau and a lot of the you know like uh, Ong and all the French academic painters, you know, which way did they go? They stopped you know painting these, you know, uh, nymph-like young thin, you know, women. And started going, you know, with these other women that were, you know, larger, you know, fuller figured, you know, and that that well stayed in the fact. wealthy women. The wealthy women were heavy. The mm -hmm. upper class were heavy. The poor were thin. Yeah. So therefore, the wealthy hired them, and they painted the fat wealthy women. Mm -hmm. Think of it. Yeah. Well, but it it was a stylistic thing too, you know. Um. And if you look at art, you know, uh, historically, um, body image, you know, has changed so much throughout history. 
and it goes back and forth. You know, the, the fashion is always changing. Uh, in fact, one of the oldest um, pieces of art ever made by humans is a Venus. And, uh, you know, it's it's a little round, you know, you, you, you definitely know that it's a human form, but it's so abstract. And that's like almost like 10,000 10, years old, 10, 10 to 12, I think. Um, and, uh, and if you look at it, you know, it's, it's a, you know, a round plump, you know, little fat lady. Uh, but the significance of it was that, you know, women who were well-fed during that time and, and larger were more successful at having children mm -hmm. and keeping the children alive. You know, rather than someone who was very, very thin. So, yeah. But it goes, it goes back and forth. You know. <clears throat> so, so don't throw in the towel yet, Naomi. You know, in the next fifty years. Oh, I don't see it. I don't know? see Chubby getting back in style. Oh, I don't know. You know, it, it's like they say. You know, everything you know old is new again. No, but it, de it definitely is. If you see the. Uh... A lot of the lingerie commercials on TV now, they're, oh, yeah. they're showing full plus sized women. Right. Well, but not only that, you know, if you look at a lot of the entertainers and, um, you know, these cultural programs like, you know, music and dance, you know, who do they who do they focus on? You know, women with the big booties, <laughs> you know, I think mean, that's kind of that's kind of come back in a way. It's kind of come back in vogue. That was never out of style, though. Um, it it was definitely that was definitely mm -hmm. out of style back, you know, in the fifties uh, and the sixties. Oh, really? Seventies? Oh, yeah. Well, twiggy, yeah. twiggy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, what was in vogue back in like the sixties in particular, <clears throat> and like really early seventies, were these women who were like literally, you know, emaciated toothpicks. And and that was the quote unquote ideal, right? And so so you know the the image of beauty, you know, does change, you know, from generation to generation and time over time. So uh, you know, it's it's it, it'll it'll all come back around again, <laughs> constantly. So anyway, uh, anybody else got any any other thoughts about? that particular film well, what, what I, do you think, I think he answered the question of why it was so intense mm -hmm. i think it, it was so intense because it affected so many people it was such a long-lived and pervasive <laughs> movement yeah and the fact that it it moved through so many different cultures right um and in fact you you know it it was a very violent time there were there were a lot of uh, kind of like petty wars yep. you know between you know different countries and kingdoms and and you know the royal family but and about later. yeah but in comparison <laughs> in comparison to the time before that say the renaissance and the late renaissance and even before that um warfare diminished greatly and when you look at it overall it's hard to say that it was a uh, you know a utopian uh you know peaceful time but compared in in you know historical context it was you know um you know there was much less warfare you know during that you know two to three hundred year period and uh, and that really helped europe in general flourish you know and and really become the society that it did so it, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to put it in perspective in my in my opinion anyway when you look at the what you say is three four hundred year period mm -hmm. and he, he he collapsed it into uh 45 minutes uh <laughs> <laughs> well that was only the first part oh he, okay yeah because from from there he he has another video uh, and as he was saying, it's like, you know, they have to cross the English Channel, right. pick that up. 
Uh, <coughs> what about friends? Pardon? I didn't see he mentioned friends. Uh, he won't really talk a lot about France until he goes to England because okay. um, what you had happened historically is that you you had the Spanish royal family, the Habsburg, mm -hmm. who who, by the way, you know, also ruled Germany. Yeah. You know, as well as most of, you know, North Germany. Germany. In fact, they pretty much so had a grip on all of Europe, except for, you know, except for England. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. and that was really the only place that was not dominated by you know, a uh, a Habsburg, you know, sitting, you know, on the throne. Uh, that would change, <laughs> you know, that would change um, really about the time of Henry VIII, you know, because uh, <clears throat> you know, one of his first wives was actually uh, a princess from France. Spain, Spain. Was it Spain? Henry yeah. VIII married Queen Isabella, Isabella. from Spain. Right. Yeah. Okay. And and we all know how that turned out, right? <laughs> so, um, but they lived twenty years happily. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that was his last marriage, right? Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, um, so you know, even the Habsburgs, you know, sort of got over into England as well, which may be why the royal family looks the way they do. So at any rate, um, but anyway, to answer your question, Bob, there there's I think there's three parts, you know, to this, you know, this whole period of the Baroque that he talks about. And he, and he travels around different parts of Europe, um, you know, to show examples of that. And we'll we'll watch some more of those if, if you guys are interested. You know, it's good. It's, it's good piece. I enjoyed it very much. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I didn't know how people would react to it. You know, people either they either have a very strong like of uh, the Baroque period, or they hate it. <laughs> you know, it's it's just kind of one of those things. You know, it's either a like or you know a dislike. But uh, well, okay. the, the art itself, though, I've enjoyed. I mean, the fact that the the the, the I. I say photorealistic, but for the time, it was probably as close as you're going to get. Uh, for, and uh, for the, the the realism, the emotion of the, of the figures in in all the paintings is oh, yeah. is very very enjoyable. Yeah. <clears throat> well, when you look at the uh, when you look at the advancements of how the human figure was painted, even from you know the Renaissance, right? Uh, Baroque painters were far more informed and knowledgeable about anatomy and movement and really capturing, you know, something, you know, pretty close to real life, you know, far more than even the Renaissance painters. So, you know, the Renaissance painters were still painting figures, again, up until about the time of Caravaggio, you know, that were pretty placid mm -hmm. and, um, you know, not a lot of movement, you know, and action. But when the Baroque came along, yeah, things things got pretty wild. So anyway. Um okay, let's see. How are we doing time wise? It is eleven thirty. Okay. Yeah. So we got time for one more short video and I'm gonna show you. And then we'll go to lunch. Okay. Uh I guess you have a, a small question. Do you get my an email from me. Uh, when did that I send you? When did you send it? Last night. Well, I haven't looked at email yet this morning. I need to, so John can critique my painting. Oh, John, you want him to critique your painting? He asked me the other day when I'm going to send something. So. Oh, okay. All right. Well, yeah, we never see anything from you. <laughs> well, okay. Well, it says uh, Armando Martinez, no subject. Uh huh. Yeah. The, okay. You got it. Okay. Uh, and, but you did evidently attach something because there's a download here. Gotcha. See what it is. Oh, it's your it's your painting on the easel. Okay. All right. 
Yeah, so that that'll be in the mix tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. Are you are you going to be around? I'm planning to. Okay. Good. Dan got decisions. Yeah, and then John, you'll you'll have a chance to look at something <laughs> that Armando did. Very good. Make I I sent some things in too that Armando can critique of mine. Good. Okay. You know. <laughs> Fair is fair, right? Fair is fair. <laughs> hey, John, I didn't see you at the party. Where were you? Oh, well. Was it no, I didn't. I didn't make it. I had a, a doctor's appointment. Oh. Okay. okay. Well, you know, we're we're moving on from okay. there. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Fifty-three. We don't have enough time for that. Let's uh, take a look at uh, Mr. Cezanne as an impressionist in his uh, triumph. We do have time for that. Oh, we're going to uh, see if it's Cowboy movie. Yes. Oh. It is now a conspiracy of witches. Download V today. At the end of the 19th century, in the south of France, the city of Aix-en-Provence and the villages surrounding its well-known landform have been the setting for a remarkable, irrational, and devouring perseverance. This nameless enthusiasm was between Paul Cézanne and Mount Sainte-Victoire. He was obsessed with Sainte-Victoire. The mountain was enchanting and had an everlasting minerality. Aix-en-Provence, 19 janvier 1839. Il est fils de chapelier devenu banquier, un autodidacte qui a fait fortune, qui s'est offert la magnifique Bastide du Jazz de Bouffant, qui était une ancienne Bastide aristocratique du Pays d'Aix. Et c'est là, donc, dans cette Bastide familiale, pendant 40 années, que Cézanne va venir peindre ses premiers paysages, ses premières vues de la montagne Sainte-Victoire. C'est véritablement le lieu de maturation de l'homme et de l'artiste. Cézanne would soon only have eyes for Saint Victoire. She remains indifferent to his attraction. Could it be any different between a painter and a mountain? Two grandiose things that are separated by just a matter of material. La Saint Victoire, elle est très ancienne. On va commencer vers à peu près euh, 130 millions d'années. Donc 130 millions d'années, on est dans un océan. Puis un peu plus tard, vers 110 millions d'années, donc on a l'Afrique qui commence à remonter en direction de l'Europe. Et comme ces deux continents commencent à se rapprocher, ces couches qui étaient au fond de la mer vont petit à petit remonter et on va avoir l'émersion de la Provence. On part de l'horizontale au fond de l'eau, émersion, le puits se couche, il casse, il avance et l'érosion ne garde que la première phalange. Donc ce qui fait que cette vague de pierre, comme on l'appelle, elle a vraiment avancé. Even though Cézanne tamed the beating tracks, landscapes, form, color, light, and the shades of Saint Victoire since his youngest years, the artist was constantly reflecting on his paintings and his favorite subject. Everything in nature is modeled on spheres, cones, and cylinders. You must learn to paint these simple shapes. Then you can do whatever you want. Cette montagne, elle fait à peu près 1000 mètres d'altitude, un, un peu plus de 1000 mètres au niveau de la croix. Elle s'étend est-ouest sur une vingtaine de kilomètres, sur à peu près 8 km nord-sud. Donc ça fait vraiment une vague, hein, avec une pente douce côté du nord et puis des falaises bien abruptes euh, au côté du sud. Les roches qu'on voit affleurer, là, les crêtes qui sont redressées, qu'on appelle le marbre, qu'on retrouve un peu partout dans les hôtels particuliers d'Est. 
qu'on en retrouve même à Versailles, au Trianon, il y a des, du marbre du Tolonais. Donc, euh, une roche qui est très, très jolie et qui a été longtemps exploitée. Cézanne wanted to understand the mineral structure of the undisturbed mountain and to penetrate the secrets in its heart of stone. Nature isn't a surface, it's a depth. The colors are an expression of this depth. They show the roots of the world. <coughs> On sait que Cézanne s'intéressait à la géologie. D'ailleurs, il a dit que pour mieux la peindre, il avait besoin de la comprendre. Il a même dit qu'il avait besoin de comprendre comment elle s'enracinait. Et il avait un ami, Fortuné Marion, qui était le conservateur du Muséum d'Histoire Naturelle de Marseille, qui l'a amené sur le terrain et qui lui a expliqué la géologie, avec les données géologiques de l'époque, bien entendu. Mais il a été initié à la géologie par son ami Fortuné Marion. Et effectivement, il sait comment sa victoire s'enracine dans ce paysage. Il connaît le phénomène géologique et c'est ainsi qu'il va pouvoir faire évoluer à travers 87 représentations de la montagne Sainte-Victoire la sensation qu'il a de cette montagne provençale. The painter's attraction to this mountain would forever weld the delicate genius of the artist and the unforgettable indifference of his beloved rocks. However, Cézanne would never know that the remains of the creatures feared by children around the world were hidden in the depths of the landscape. We are here on the site of the Reserve Natural of Saint Victor. We are on the Reserve Natural, Geological and Biological. Euh, qui est aussi un site majeur paléontologique puisque c'est l'un des plus gros gisements au monde à œufs de dinosaures et depuis peu aussi à Haussmann. Ce site, celui de Roquehaute, de Roqueuil, c'est un site qui a 74 millions d'années. C'est bien plus ancien encore que les derniers dinosaures qui ont disparu. Là, on était vraiment à l'apogée de la biodiversité, la paléobiodiversité des dinosaures provençaux. Au moment des dinosaures, il faut complètement oublier le, la, la scène victoire de Cézanne. La scène victoire de Cézanne n'existe pas encore. On a une montagne, on a un relief qui émerge et on a un grand fleuve qui s'étend le long d'une plaine, au pied d'une montagne. Et ce fleuve va apporter des limons. Donc il y avait toute une végétation luxuriante au bord de ce, de ce fleuve et les dinosaures et les vivre là et pondre là. C'est bon Sur le terrain, le premier travail, c'est de repérer les coquilles. Ensuite, on va réaliser une coque en place. Et ensuite, on va décoller le bloc, le retourner. Et à ce moment-là, on ramène au laboratoire pour le dégager. Un œuf dégagé va ressembler à ça. Donc là, il est déformé. Il faut imaginer que les œufs, initialement, étaient plus, plus ronds. C'était vraiment ils étaient sphériques. Et avec le poids des millions d'années, ils ont été euh, petit à petit continués. Voilà, donc, euh, classiquement, un œuf de dinosaure de la région de Oh, welcome to Madame. Tout le monde est là, les gens. Jusqu'à présent, on ne sait pas encore quel dinosaure pondait les œufs. C'est l'intérêt de, de ce livre. Depuis trois ans, par contre, nous avons découvert, de façon un peu surprenante et fortuite, une couche extrêmement riche à, à œufs de dinosaure. Pour la première fois, nous avons énormément d'informations sur les squelettes partiellement complets. Et là, sur ce secteur-là, vous avez un cimetière arabe de C'est un dinosaure herbivore qui était très fréquent en Provence. Nous avons d'autres animaux. Nous avons trouvé des dents de carnivores. Parmi ces dents de carnivores, nous avons des dents de raptor. Le raptor local ici s'appelle Variraptor, qui a été découvert ici et dans le vin. Nous avons aussi découvert des restes d'un gros carnivore. Arcovenator escotale, c'est aussi euh, bon, le plus gros carnivore, environ 6 mètres de long. Mais c'est aussi le dernier dinosaure à avoir été découvert euh, en Provence, puisque ses restes ont été mis à jour le long de l'autoroute A8 en 2013. We have explored the depths of the mountain and dared to paint the marble and its flaws. It's a quarry carved from the imposing blocks of earth yellow stone which would seduce the artist. 
Cézanne a un réel attachement aux carrières de Bidémus, parce que c'est un lieu qu'il connaît depuis son enfance. C'est un lieu où il allait jouer au milieu des rochers avec ses condisciples du collège. Donc il le connaissait parfaitement bien, c'est au pied de la montagne Sainte-Victoire. Lorsque dans les années 1890, il revient régulièrement à Aix-en-Provence, euh, il demande à son ami d'enfance, qui était devenu donc, le propriétaire de ses carrières de Bidémus, de lui laisser les clés d'un cabanon pour stocker son matériel de peintre. Et là, c'est le point de départ pour aller peindre ces magnifiques rochers rouges. Et là, Cézanne expérimente véritablement euh, ses théories en matière de peinture, à savoir comment euh, les couleurs chaudes peuvent créer une perspective dans la toile. Il s'installe au sommet d'un de ces rochers pour peindre des blocs qu'il a en face de lui. Et il voit dépasser derrière un tout petit bout de la montagne Sainte-Victoire. Mais pour lui, ce petit bout devient la montagne dans sa totalité et elle finit par occuper toute la partie supérieure dans le ciel où elle apparaît. Et effectivement, Cézanne recompose d'après nature le motif qu'il a sous les yeux. Avec les rouges, les ocres, les jaunes, les oranges, les rochers, il arrive à créer avec l'environnement euh, des arbres verts et du ciel bleu ce contraste qui permet, alors qu'on ne voit quasiment pas de ciel dans ses œuvres peintes à Bidémus, d'absorber le regard du spectateur. Painting nature isn't about copying the subject. It's about reproducing the sensations. Cézanne se qualifie de peintre de plein air. C'est effectivement un très très grand marcheur. Cézanne quitte son atelier, quitte les musées pour aller peindre la nature telle qu'il la voit en plein air. Et c'est effectivement ce grand courant qui marque le début de l'impressionnisme. wants to follow in the steps of the tireless rambler, the route still exists that he traveled on foot and then by carriage to reach the mountain without startling it. This portion of the departmental road 17, which was named Route Cézanne, is the only asphalted road classed as a historical monument in France. The Minister of Culture, André Marot, agreed to this position in 1959. Traveling this road allows you to discover what lies behind several miles of vegetation that has lined the road for more than a century, and to discover what remains of the landscapes immortalized by the artist. We are at the end of the village of Tolone, and on the bottom of the road of Cézanne, there is a only monument qui s'appelle le Moulin Cézanne. Alors Moulin Cézanne, il n'a que de nous, puisque ce moulin du XVIIe siècle existait bien sûr du temps de Cézanne, mais ce qui est assez curieux, c'est qu'il ne le peignit jamais, car il venait ici pour une seule et bonne raison, c'est le point de vue qu'on a derrière, c'est la montagne Saint-Victoire. Donc il venait peindre juste en dessous du moulin, mais aujourd'hui, pour avoir ce fameux point de vue cézanien, eh bien, il faut prendre un petit peu de hauteur, et du coup il faut se mettre sur l'embas circulaire du moulin qui servait à battre le blé, pour avoir exactement le même point de vue que bien sur la montagne Saint-Victoire. Sur Saint-Victoire, on peut se rendre compte devant nous, hein, c'est quand même un endroit majestueux et euh, on a donc une mosaïque, donc une multitude d'habitats différents. Donc en partant du haut de la montagne, on a, là, ça se découpe bien, la ligne de crête, ou sur cette ligne de crête, on va trouver ce qu'on appelle des pelouses. Euh, des pelouses où on va trouver une multitude d'espèces de plantes, euh, comme des orchidées, euh, euh, comme des iris, comme des narcisses. Euh, après, petit à petit, on descend dans un milieu euh, rupestre, un milieu de falaise, un milieu chaud et sec, euh, où dans ce milieu, alors là, la végétation a beaucoup de mal à s'installer. On va trouver un peu des reliques de pain, de genévriers, de chênes. Petit à petit, on continue de descendre pour arriver au piémont de la montagne, où là, c'est le milieu de Garrigue. On va avoir pas mal d'épineux. 
avance, on avance pour arriver ici, dans les prairies. Alors là, les prairies, d'un seul coup, le milieu s'ouvre complètement. Des pelouses avec une multitude de végétation rase et basse. Pour continuer et arriver sur la colline du Devançon, où là, on va vraiment rentrer dans un milieu forestier, fermé, avec principalement du chêne et du pain. Just look at Saint Victoire. What a monument. What a compelling thirst for sunlight. And what melancholy in the evening when heaviness descends. If you are the owner or manager of a building with a flat top roof, then hmm. these stones come from fire. There's still fire in them. Ici, nous avons euh, les restes d'un chêne euh, scalciné, euh, donc, euh, qui date de l'incendie euh, de Saint-Victoire. Le feu a pris euh, le 28 août 1989 euh, et a brûlé euh, environ euh, 5000 hectares. Donc, c'est quand même une très très grande surface. Cet euh, incendie en fait, a mis toutes les roches à nu, ce qui a fait que tous les fossiles étaient facilement repérables. Et donc du coup, bah, les paléontologues amateurs, les collectionneurs, les vendeurs, les pilleurs sont venus se servir à tel point qu'on a eu un pillage européen qui s'est organisé sur le site. Après l'incendie de 89, le territoire a été passé en réserve naturelle pour pouvoir poser une protection juridique et réglementaire forte sur ce terrain. Au départ, c'était quand même impressionnant, tout était calciné, tout était noir, le paysage des Aniens, donc vous des questions, c'était fini, il disparaissait dans une fraction, une fraction de seconde. Euh, après, il faut quand même relativiser. Euh, petit à petit, on s'est rendu compte qu'on redécouvrait un paysage euh, magnifique qui était en train de se refermer par la forêt. Euh, et surtout, derrière, euh, cet espace ouvert a laissé place à une biodiversité assez exceptionnelle. Donc ici, sur la montagne, on a euh, une faune euh, assez particulière. On a une espèce vraiment emblématique, hein, c'est euh, un rapace, c'est l'aigle de Bonnelli. Donc on a deux couples sur la montagne euh, Saint-Victoire. Sur ces milieux rocheux, hein, le milieu rupestre de falaise, on va trouver aussi des mammifères un peu emblématiques. Euh, ça, peu de gens le savent. Euh, on va trouver du chamois sur Saint-Victoire. Alors très peu, on doit avoir trois euh, ou quatre individus, mais avec quand même reproduction de chamois sur la montagne. Euh, on va avoir du mousson à manchette et aussi on peut avoir, mais plutôt au nord de la montagne, du mousson euh, de Corse. Donc des espèces qu'on n'est pas habitué mmh. à voir dans ce milieu. Mmh. Shadow is a color, just like light, except less bright. Light and shadow are not just two tones. You don't make light. You reproduce. Cézanne a peint de nombreux paysages, mais un seul revient régulièrement dans son œuvre, c'est la montagne Sainte-Victoire. D'ailleurs, c'est une véritable obsession. Il n'arrive pas à peindre Sainte-Victoire et il s'exprimera à ce sujet. Il dira longtemps, je suis resté sans savoir, sans pouvoir peindre Sainte-Victoire parce qu'il se trompait en observant les ombres et les lumières sur ce motif. Et lorsqu'il va enfin comprendre comment elle fonctionne, comment la lumière s'attache à ces blocs de roche, il va réussir enfin à la peindre. Mais c'est ici, depuis le sommet de la colline Véloz, qu'il reviendra pendant les quatre dernières années de sa vie de manière très obsessionnelle pour réaliser 28 œuvres. Il y a 11 huiles et 17 aquarelles peinte exactement depuis ce même endroit qui montre son attachement jusqu'à la fin de sa vie à la montagne Saint-Victoire.
Today, many are still searching to capture the multiple facets of St. Victoire. For some, photography has replaced paintbrushes and easels. However, if Cézanne lay prostrate at the foot of his beloved mountain like a coy lover, other more reckless artists have come over his head to try to catch a glimpse of his spirit. Je vous faisais des photos au sol, comme tout bon photographe qui se respecte. Vous venez le matin, vous venez le soir, j'ai promené mon regard un peu partout, j'ai essayé tous les sentiers, et puis, et puis je voyais ces ailes en l'air, et puis, je me disais, je me disais, avoir un bon point de vue dans le C'est un petit, à force de me le dire, un jour, j'ai franchi le phare, j'ai fait un trajet de parapente. Ah. Et après, après quelques années de, de pratique, j'ai réussi à enfin amener mon appareil photo euh, vers les sommets. Et là, effectivement, j'ai découvert une autre cette victoire. Je suis sorti de la cette victoire de Cézanne pour aller dans une cette victoire plus sauvage, plus, plus immense, plus, plus dangereuse aussi. Mm. Je passe comme ça. Je me suis aperçu que les gens découvraient la montagne à travers mes images. Et loin du but artistique, c'était plutôt un but pédagogique quelque part. D'avoir justement, ce, de voir ces gens regarder les sentiers, les pistes, les, les passages, les, qu'on ne voit pas du sol. Car les photos, je voulais leur montrer ça, faire partager, c'est un partage. Je... For two years, a secret army of federal and private contractors has been working quietly. Voilà, c'est ça, et quand tu regardes ces arêtes qui montent, quand tu regardes ces plaques là qui s'érigent de tous les côtés, c'est des trous, c'est des rochers, c'est de la falaise, c'est des garrigues, c'est des animaux, c'est des oiseaux, c'est... c'est la vue qu'on peut avoir sur Marseille quand il fait beau, quand il n'y a pas cette boule, c'est... La vue sur le moment tout, les écrins, euh, on voit des choses en haut. Alors on est là aussi pour faire découvrir ça, tu vois. C'est, 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 c'est magique. Nous sommes le 16 octobre, c'est un lundi, un lundi ensoleillé. Cézanne quitte son atelier, prend sa toile, ses chevalets pliés en portatif, son sac à dos dans lequel se trouve son matériel de peinture, et il monte à pied jusqu'au point de vue qu'il est en train de peindre, c'est un petit cabanon, le cabanon d'un de ses amis, le cabanon de Jourdan. Il se rend compte, parce qu'il connaît parfaitement bien son pays, que le ciel est en train de changer de couleur. Sainte Victoire se couvre de son chapeau, et on sait très bien en Provence que quand Sainte Victoire a son chapeau, il va prendre son sac et vite partir, un morage va s'abattre sur la campagne de l'Espagne. Et c'est effectivement ce qui arrive, un morage tombe sur le lieu où ses amis sont en train de peindre, il va continuer à peindre, il va attraper froid. Un malaise le froid, et ce sont des blanchisseurs qui passent par là, qui le reconnaissent. Il est inanimé sur le bord du chemin. Ils vont le redescendre dans son appartement, au centre-ville. Il commence à avoir une pleurésie. Le mal va empirer. Et c'est dans la nuit du 22 au 23 octobre 1906 que Cézanne décédera des suites de sa pleurésie. Je ne sais pas 
relation obsessionnelle qu'avait Cézanne, oui, quelque part, je la comprends, parce que moi aussi, quand j'étais petite, j'allais me promener sur la montagne Saint-Victoire, j'allais me balader, j'allais courir, et c'est quelque part, ça fait partie de nous. Saint-Victoire, elle est à la fois majestueuse et à la fois très intime. Quand on va n'importe où, aux quatre coins du monde, on a toujours cette part de Saint-Victoire qui est en nous, et Cézanne le disait lui aussi, il disait, quand on est né là-bas, c'est foutu, rien ne vous dit. Elle est exceptionnelle dans le sens où elle est là, où on, on, on la rend nous exceptionnelle peut-être. Je crois que c'est plutôt ça. On a envie qu'elle soit exceptionnelle. Je veux dire, depuis que ces années la peinte, euh, la saint évitant est exceptionnelle. Si tu parles à un vieux diable, un siècle ou deux, peut-être il te dirait que c'est qu'un bout de caillou sur lequel il fait très chaud et qu'il faut le crever pour faire pousser les poches. Aix conserve la montagne Sainte-Victoire, ça personne ne nous l'apprendra. Et euh, aussi euh, les trois principaux sites, l'atelier de Cézanne, les carrières de Vivenus, la Bastille du Jazz de Bouffon. Et nous pouvons donc ainsi euh, confronter euh, l'objet réel à la tentative de représentation euh, de l'artiste. Et bien on se rend compte que Cézanne a véritablement été un des plus grands artistes euh, de la fin du 19e et du début du 20e siècle. From a distance, St. Victoire sits under the haze of the sun's heat. These charred cliffs, resembling a defensive wall, have protected for more than a century the eternal sleep of a painter who understood and loved the landscape. How is Ready Wise superior to other emergency food? There we go. <clears throat> what do you guys think? It was interesting to me to see that he painted and he painted and he painted and then he had a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. All of that, all of that homework was worth, worth him getting to the point where he knew what he was doing. Yeah. Did you see the little part where it said how many watercolors he had done? Yeah. yeah. 11,000. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 I mean, that's a lot of watercolor work. That's a <laughs> lot of watercolor work. And that was all that was all before his breakthrough. Right. You know. I wish they would have shown a little bit more of the artwork. <laughs> um, yeah, we will. We'll we'll go back. We'll we'll take a little retrospective on him and look at a lot of his work. But uh <clears throat> you know, I think um if one thing I wanted to kind of mention. If you listened, even when they were speaking French, right, there were a couple of words that came out when they were talking about grassland, the word prairie, right, which is actually French, okay, um, and also, you know, plein air, you know, when, when they were saying that, you know, he was painting outdoors, the actual right. term was plein air, and so, <laughs> yeah, so, so those are, you know, directly French uh, phrases that we've adopted into our language, you know, with, you know, many other French words, um, you know, so they're, they're part of our everyday language and we don't even think about, you know, really where the origins of, of those words came from, but there's two that came from France. Okay. Anyway, uh, anybody got anything else you want to cover questions? Nope. Okay. We got shrimp at the at the center today. All right. Well, I guess if you want shrimp, you better get going. <laughs> anyway, uh, we will see you tomorrow at uh, two o'clock. Okay, and then Wednesday morning, um, you know, we'll have the last class before the holidays. Okay, and then uh, and then we'll pick up on Monday after that. Okay. So there'll be no classes on either Thursday or Friday. Uh, and then, like I said, we'll get back into our usual routine, you know, for at least, uh, what, uh, um, almost two weeks. weeks. <laughs> yeah. So you, yeah. you are going to miss us because you will have nothing to do. Who, me? Yes. <laughs> you don't think I have something to do? Oh, uh, you will go to Valley. 
to work in that house. Well, not only that, I've got, uh, I've got, I've got so many things to do, or <laughs> But, but yes, you know that doesn't mean I, I, I don't miss you guys either. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, all right. So hopefully we'll see you back here tomorrow afternoon. Okay. All right. See you tomorrow. All okay. right. Bye. 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 Bye.